Welcome to the Climbing Talent Development Show. We start with a very broad theme for today. Uh, we intend to do the show twice a month. And today we want to talk about physical literacy and what physical literacy is. And physical literacy is the motivation, the confidence, the physical competence, knowledge and understanding required by participants that allows them to value and take responsibility for engaging in physical activity and sports for life. And I had to read this and you might be a little bit disappointed that it's uh, not really talking about any physical uh, attributes as you might expect. And when you first uh, read this definition about uh, of physical literacy what were you thinking well actually the first thing i thought whenever we i think for a lot of people's a lot of coaches whenever you hear physical literacy it's one of those things where i think everybody immediately connects with what what it like the words are but then it's really hard to put a definition to it and i think what yes. you did was like a you know it's a really difficult thing to do because as coaches for all of us, if you say physical literacy, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah I understand what that is. But um, I think even looking at, as we continue forward in this climbing development show, this is going to be our roadmap in a way. And this is something yeah. we developed. I don't know. How long ago did you make this? It's, it's always ongoing. These, these mind maps, these confusing mind maps of mine, they're, they're ongoing projects. So, so I always from time to time, I open up the file and then I, I change something. Maybe, maybe I give you a quick run through uh, through the mind map. Uh, there's the social domain with uh, society and culture, with relationships, collaboration, ethics. Then there is uh, what I think most people, including me, at first think of physical literacy, the physical domain with skills and fitness, uh, things like strength, balance, movement skills, agility, all the good stuff. And uh, here you find the psychological domain, which is really important in, yeah, in any kind of climbing. Climbing is always, it's either scary or it's a, a competitive environment. It's a, it's a mind game very often. So we, over the course of this uh, show, we will talk a lot about all the domains, but, uh, a lot about the psychological aspects of, of climbing and of coaching. And then there's, of course, the cognitive domain uh, with reasoning, strategy and planning is important, perceptual awareness, tactics, understanding rules, this stuff. Uh, and maybe, maybe, Al, we should show uh, some examples, you know, ju just from the from the recent uh, Boulder World Cup in in Meiringen. The last problem in the uh, women's semis. Each of them has different strategies. Uh, this is one thing that's particular to modern bouldering is that the the clean cut beta is almost gone. So they have to find their own way, and you see in all these four or five examples that I'm showing you, uh, the solutions are slightly different. And this is Akio Noguchi with I, what looked in real time like the smoothest uh, uh, way to climb the section. But she is, uh, if you stop her, she is not as fast as the next example. Well, let, let her climb a little bit. Bob. And this is, of course, Janja Gambret. And I remind you, I will show you the mind map later, but there is one aspect in the mind map, uh, confidence. You know? And she was actually the only one who wasn't climbing feet first and did a rather straightforward method. And I think all the other girls that I showed would have been perfectly capable of doing it the way Janja does, but I think they were just lacking the confidence. So even if it's just about what beta or what solution you choose, it already comes back to your, uh, well, to the psychological domain. 
of uh, physical literacy. So let me see where the, where the confidence, here's the confidence. A belief in self-worth and ability to perform in movement and physical activity. Yeah, Udo, if you can go back to the video, I think, uh, like you mentioned, that clip shows so much of what competition climbing is about. And especially in this mind map, I think something that we'll be going over a lot in the future um, for modern bouldering is one of the really engaging things about watching competition climbing is that, you know, the event isn't decided, like the winner isn't decided until the competition takes place. And I think the fact that you can almost get lost in that map in, in terms of all the things as a competition climber that it requires for, for you to put together a good performance means that there is an opportunity for people to compete and show up and essentially like dominate certain aspects of that mind map. And for instance, one of these being confidence in your ability to, to determine that this is the way I'm going to do this boulder. Because like you said, it's not clear and we can't go into some sort of traditional route reading where we say left hand here, right hand here, left foot here. If you're doing that, you're missing a lot of the information. Um, and all of these climbers come up with different solutions and you can see through the time, all of those decisions kind of have a compounding effect later on in the round. If you, if you don't take, if you take too much time, if it's a really taxing solution, uh, that might not be you know, that might not stop you from topping that boulder then, but it might stop top, stop you from topping boulder later. This was boulder number four, but same thing. It might have, a, you know, an effect in your next round. Um, and I think it's, it's like part of being in these competitions and having these experiences and being able to develop as an athlete in all of the areas of the mind map are essentially tools that you can call on during competitions to to have more success if basically it'd be pretty boring i guess what i'm getting at is be pretty boring if it was just the physical aspect of it and that's essentially all that decided who who was on top of the podium at the end of the day yeah and uh, i think uh, another aspect i think we forgot to tell the audience what this show is really uh, what we think our audience is and I, I think I'm, I'm thinking of parents, youth coaches, but also athletes as the audience. Uh, and what I'm, uh, why I'm mentioning this is this is was just an example of one competition taking place with all mature athletes. You know, and the, the example was meant to show that even in a, in a small little crux of, of a boulder problem, you already see all these character traits, soft skills. You know, at least for me, uh, I see all those uh, yeah things even while they are just bouldering. You know, but if you think about it, the, our show is intended to um, yeah inspire the the approach and the, and the way to when they're actually uh, on the pod, uh, on on the mats and actually trying to climb something, you know? so all these these different domains might have different time frames. You know? for for example, the social domain. Yes, of course, when they are when they are inspecting the boulder problems, there's a social element to this. But the social domain, once the competition starts, it's uh, not the most important one. Whereas the, the years and maybe even decades before, this is really important. Yeah, and that, that is essentially a, a big reason why federations have started developing like a, an athlete development model because essentially yes. thinking of windows of opportunity for athletes to develop in certain areas is going to be uh, better than in others. I mean, even just thinking like physically, but just mentally kind of like what, what the athletes are what kind of information they're going to easily digest at what age. Um, but yeah. another thing I want to outline from this is essentially anybody looking at this as a coach, I think um, we're always working on different parts of this map, obviously without knowing it. I think it's really cool that you have it laid out. The way you, you're laying it out, essentially, if you, if you focus yourself too much into one of those lobes or one of those yeah. parts of it, you're missing out on, a lot of things that you could be improving upon. 
And you can see these also in athletes who are who have been injured, essentially, who, uh, you know, it can it can serve as something that's really going to make you feel bad about your continuing development in climbing. But there's still a lot of other portions uh, that you can be working on. And even just becoming aware that these are like really important and acknowledging to yourself that these are really important for you as a competition climber can be really nice. Same thing for coaches, uh, just knowing that there's something that you could be doing with your athletes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even in an ideal world, uh, people wouldn't get hurt as much. You know, I think the injury rate in, in climbing is far too high. And, uh, and this is not only because of uh, physical aspects. It's also uh, maybe that athletes uh, are not empowered enough. You know, there's uh, not many coaches uh, encourage auto-regulation, for example, so that the athlete decides what uh, she or he wants to, to train on this day. You know, that, I feel there's still a lot. If you compare, I mean, we are, I, I'm from Germany. You are originally from uh, Colombia. So uh, we are in, in Germany. Everyone is somehow interested in what the Americans call soccer. The rest yeah. of the world calls football. And if you compare what's happening in, in football in terms of coaching and tel talent development, of course, there are the billions uh, 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 on stake you know, with, with uh, football talent. But I, I still... I think we can do a lot better job even without all the resources that football has in our approach of talent development in, in climbing. Yeah, maybe you can give us, I, I think that this would be interesting to go into, but uh, like your background in athletics as, as a, you know, as an individual and as a coach, because I, I'm not, yeah. a tradi like I didn't start climbing. So it's just interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. I started climbing rather late, too, because there was no uh, venue. There was no, no climbing gyms when uh, in, the, in the early 80s when I, when I started climbing. And before that, I did uh, track and uh, especially whitewater kayaking. And there was really a total top-down coaching, which encouraged me to uh, think uh, for myself because I really disliked uh, all the the hierarchies and uh, uh, yeah, even the, the coaching, you know, and uh, it was very empowering in a way, you know. So I just fought through. Uh, they didn't like me, but I learned to to organize my own training from from early on, you know. And later, I coached a friend of mine who became five times world champion in, 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 uh, over the next decade and was invincible. And we uh, just on his kitchen table, we developed what's nowadays called uh, polarized training for endurance. And also basically that you train either really hard or really, really soft. But don't uh, train the, the, the exhausting stuff in the middle. You know, we developed this and this was really a fantastic experience because it was all based on just... Uh, what we were thinking, you know, it was basically we made this plan and he, he trained accordingly and he, he won all these competitions. So that was a fantastic experience that I had while I uh, was still caring about my own uh, uh, climbing. And um, if you're interested in another uh, um, experience that uh, took me where I'm now is that I coached um, circus arts and performing arts. And so, so it, there's no physical aspects. So these almost are the diff, the total opposite. You know, like uh, whitewater kayaking is power endurance. It's 20 minutes. It has a technical element because of the whitewater, but it's really, really strenuous. And the physical aspects are really important. And then I went to my circus kids and. Uh, and it was all about like skill, being, being uh, having good uh, eye-hand coordination. And all this happened far before I got to work with the German boulder, boulder team, you know? Uh, so I think if knowing that about you now, I think explains a lot about your coaching, especially with the circus arts. And it feels like you became, developed like a really good appreciation for like you know, the physical aspect, it's like a, a good meld there from the whitewater and the, and the circus arts. 
for me, it was, I, I mean, I played soccer since I was young. That was like the big sport. And I, I started climbing uh, when I was 20, around 20, something like that. So relative, I mean, by, by standards nowadays, might as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like incredibly late. Um, but I, immediately the, the moment I started climbing, I was also route setting. And I think that's kind of yeah. like what I took to the most. And uh, as for me, I think my coaching goes through the lens of route setting that the part that, you know, I, I really like route setting is just like modern kind of coordination bouldering stuff. And most of that I can, I feel like I identify more with my soccer in youth than I do with my climbing development, if that makes sense. And and the other yeah. thing that I attribute to a, a big part is a, uh, there was a period of time where I stopped climbing so much. Um, you just, yeah, I, you just kind of go through lulls where maybe, where maybe you're not as, you know, the, everybody knows that feeling of like, if I'm not in the gym, I'm not getting better. Um, I think we kind yeah. of all hit like a particular point in our climbing career like that. And then there was a point where I didn't climb very much at all, except to forerun and route set, which was like very infrequent but my climbing got way better just because I got physically weaker from, you know, the lack of actual physical training, but I just really wanted to climb the stuff that I was climbing before anyway. So I had to learn how to be way, way, way more wiggly, I guess it would be the way yeah. to put it. Um, yeah. But I think we're, we're touching on many, it's almost a little paradox because the same is true. I feel for, for the athletes too. You know, very few athletes have this uh, rich environment in their in their uh, children's years. You know, for example, there is uh, not enough free play in the lives of most children. Uh, like many many children don't play tag to the extent we played it. You no, know, you call it tag or chase? Or you, no, it was uh, it was tag. It was tag. Tag, right? And and. I mean, if let's see if there is well, there's for example in in this in the in the mind map there is agility, and I was just, so ability to quickly change body positions and or directions of the body, and uh, and we we know from from our workshops and when we're working with athletes that uh, yeah, well, in my view, if you had kids from from the 60s, 70s, you would have more agile kids. Now kids were more agile. Uh, a couple of decades ago. And I, I think this, this agility, this natural agility, the change of direction, you know, and, and uh, uh, this comes from free play and they, they don't have this anymore. And at the same time, they're spending a lot of time in, in fantastic boulder gyms or, or climbing gyms. Uh, but I feel, again, coming back to, if you just look at the, the physical domains, it's almost that nowadays climbing coaches have to provide uh, opportunities uh, to, to learn these, these uh, aspects. You know? And the same is true for coaches too. I, I think I, if I, I wouldn't know if I would have been like a proper climbing coach, went uh, through a proper climbing coach education. You know, by the standards, like even uh, it was uh, 13 years ago, uh, uh, that I started to the German Alpine Club and just if they had like a, uh, they had some education, but that has had nothing to do with anything uh, that was asked for. There was a lot of, of safety stuff you know, for to not uh, get buried by an avalanche. So there was not a whole uh, <laughs> useful stuff, but it's also a little bit, uh, I, I think it can mess with your, your mindset because there's always, if you learn something, that's a dogma almost. You now, even if it's not, meant to be a dogma but as a young student you think oh this is the word from god you know i have to do this and this uh, of course can make you less creative and less uh thinking for your own yeah because you, know? you mentioned the, in the white water rafting like that you designed this idea in your kitchen you know i think that's hard yeah, to yeah. do if you've been in in like a system since the beginning and i think what we're talking about is also uh, a big reason why you know most studies right now show that early specialization in kids is not necessarily a good thing um, just because we essentially you are like 
narrowing down more and more which part of the physical literacy that we're talking about. A, kind of, a big reason why nowadays you hear that early specialization for kids is can be problematic because essentially you you're kind of clipping off a big portion of this physical literacy domain that that an athlete can gain and a lot of that comes from like you said playing outside playing tag uh, for me like the agility you mentioned modern bouldering right now requires a lot more agility than it did in the past especially with, with a lower body kind of like running well, I guess people call it parkour. We can get into that at some point in time. I don't know how much I agree with that. Yeah. But <laughs> it, no, it, that I, I, comes I, from I, soccer for me. Yeah. I, I think that's also like, even if you uh, look at route setting, uh, I, I think almost the same thing happened. I mean, many of the most accomplished route setters are even older than, or my age, you know, so in their late 50s. Uh, uh, and or, or early 60s, like like Jackie Goudov. So there's that, but there's also the people that brought really like new a new style, this so-called parkour style. Uh, these were rather decent skateboarders, and and uh, you know, and if you think about it, usually you wouldn't think that that skateboarding is. Uh, can co contribute anything to your climbing, but uh, all these shuffle moves, you know, and it's it, maybe they set the way they set because of their skateboard past, but it was definitely an infusion from another uh, domain into climbing. Yeah, no, I mean, it's the same for me for setting. I think it's like, you know, these kind of like uh, the foot coordination things are, are, I, I think I've mentioned this to you before. I played volleyball and I think, uh, you know, I can see athletes, especially climbers who aren't doing other sports, uh, something as simple as measuring your steps as you're running up to a wall. Uh, it's a skill that climbers don't generally have. Cause if you're not practicing that anywhere else, for me, it's intuitive at this point. If I'm going to run up to a wall, I don't think like left foot, right foot, three steps, and then I'm onto the wall. But for it, you can see almost like you can see these in competitions where the athletes are kind of just like grinding their to a halt brain yeah. thinking about like okay do i go left foot here or right foot here and for a lot of those people like you said skateboarder no way like you you're just falling that's you know as you're falling a lot of this is just comes from instinct and it's it's really interesting especially for route setters because a lot of times the athletes on in certain ways like it's going to be hard to set something for them where uh you know we can kind of define who the best athlete is on that day and for them if that's something that they're capable of like it, it's almost a little bit of showing up from the from you know their outsiders it's like oh look at how easily i can do this move and let's see how the athletes struggle with it yeah yeah so uh this is I, one hope uh we have with this show to uh, basically the same thing to infuse new ideas into the, uh, the the yeah the thinking about uh, climbing talent development, you already mentioned that um, that uh, of course federations are uh, having their own talent development workshops, and this is just a presentation. I can quickly go through from the British Mountaineering Council, and. Um, when I go through what do we mean by talented, you now then uh, practicing. This is a highly recommended book, uh, The Talent Code. Uh, this is a little bit of a myth buster in terms of, of talent. Now, okay, there's another complicated mind map. We won't go into this. You know? And so all these relative age effect, you know, all these uh, things, that uh, I, I think with the Olympic Games that really uh, kicked off a lot of effort uh, by many federations to get more structure and to make sure that they uh, don't lose talent. Because I think this is what's happening really often in, uh, in many in all countries, basically, but in some countries to a lesser extent, that talent gets bur burned out and. Uh, that, that drop out of climbing. Yeah, so I guess let's discuss the why a little bit because I think this is the important thing about it. So why why this show? Why are we talking about it? 
I think a, a big part for me of the why is exactly what you're talking about. Not just athlete development, but you know, how can you maintain athletes at a high level? And one of the interesting things about rock climbing and competition climbing that I think I it's hard to know exactly how many sports I, I like to think that it's fairly unique in this way, but I'm sure there's a lot of other examples. There's this aspect of route setting that is a moving target for these athletes. And you can see there's some athletes in the World Cup stage who are able to adapt to these and, you know, can have longevity in their career. But you can also see the other side, which is that, that some athletes are become very resentful when the style changes. And uh, part of that might be like, like we talked about, the parkour style always comes to mind, whereas it's like, this isn't rock climbing. And I think that's an interesting conversation to have on its own and be like, what is rock climbing and how do, you know, how do we present the best rock climber as, as I think, you know, climbing competition should. But at the end of the day, you kind of don't want to leave it up to chance. And the tools that we are kind of going over uh, for myself, for you as a coach, for athletes, for parents, is how to develop a process for becoming good athletes and ultimately good athletes can adapt a lot better than people who aren't good athletes. And yeah, exactly. But for this, you need to acknowledge that it's an open activity in terms of uh, that the environment can be always changing. And I think this is a little bit difficult uh, for climbing because we have this red point uh, pass. You know, rock climbing is all about like one climb up one route and uh, with a certain grade uh, and and this is almost a, a closed activity you know, because you rehearse you rehearse rehearse and you finally you perform and this has a lot less variables in the way you know since you also can choose your preferred style of a route and i think this is uh, like mindset wise uh, this is a little bit difficult and i i, I struggle with some athletes uh, like very often you have the situation that you really would like the athlete to repeat what she just did, maybe a difficult dyno that she had been trying a lot. And with uh, climbers that have their, their roots in, in uh, rock climbing, um, this is a little bit hard to do because they're just not used to, they're, they're not really used to practice in a way, you know, or what they call practice, but basically working on their project and it contributes to learning the route, but they don't practice uncertainty and, uh, and the ability to wake up at three o'clock at night and then perform, you know, uh, very often, like even these competitors on, on the World Cup, a lot of them ha have the, the vague hope that their weakness won't be addressed, you know. And as a coach, that's really uh, it's a it's difficult to argue. Yeah, and it and in some ways it's be, it's been a viable strategy, but I think not if you want to continue to be. I mean, ultimately, I think everybody wants to continue to get better. And uh, for as a coach, you want to prepare your athletes the best way that you can. So I guess our pitch for the show, if we were to have one, is that you know both for you and I, I i especially don't feel like i don't know everything obviously and it's it's about learning as much as i can because i i do feel like this sport evolves so quickly and that's one of the things that's really fun about it you know it's not like we know exactly where the target is all the time it's constantly changing you get surprised frequently and so making adaptable athletes is really the key here um, there's certain things, you know, that a climber physically and mentally should be able and prepared to do, but a lot of it is, is, is changing frequently. And so we're going to be talking about those things, maybe trying to bring up some things that people haven't thought about and offering ideas and ideas. Yes. basically exactly. experimentation and saying, you know, here's something that we noticed with basically in Maringen, watching some videos that are really interesting and offer them up and let people say, this is what we're thinking and it's interesting. And here are some ideas on maybe how to work on those parts of, of climbing. 
and hope that everybody else kind of like adds and continues to contribute to that. Yes. Is that you a good want, uh, um, <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, you, uh, an, an example, another example of Meiringen, Nathaniel Coleman in the finals. You, yeah. you want me to play so, it? And you play, yeah. You, yeah, okay. I don't. So okay. kind of when you and I chatted, we were kind of thinking about examples of, of the last competition that we wanted to highlight. Um, and I'll just let this run for a second. Yeah. But for me, I think something about this boulder that I really appreciate is that it's really becoming like, this is my preferred blending of new school and old school together. Yes. Because uh, essentially we do still have this coordination move which has its roots, like it, it doesn't, it might not be as flashy as running across 15 feet and paddling a bunch, but all the parts that have to work together in order to perform the, the move successfully are very similar. They're just maybe not as flashy. And another reason why I really like this clip was, and you can kind of see it here, that was kind of the big moment for me. As a coach, what I'm looking for for athletes when they fall and you know this too, many athletes react very differently when they fall off a boulder. And you can kind of get an idea of what they're thinking. They give it away sometimes. Some some people are better at like, you know, keeping their poker face, but they might look at their hands and say, oh, okay, I dry fired. It's a skin issue. They might look at their feet like, oh, the foot, you know, the shoe, what happened to it? For me, it was when I was playing soccer. If, if a player missed a penalty kick and they look at the spot to see if the grass, like a blade of grass was wrong. It's very similar, but essentially yeah. something that I really like about Nathaniel in this clip is you can kind of tell basically in his mind when he comes down and he slaps his hands and he has that smile on his face that the game is on and he's going to figure it out. He doesn't ultimately end up topping the route, but you can kind of see in his head that he was putting all the pieces together. Okay, the first move, I've unlocked it. And I think I know what to do in this next uh, portion of the boulder. And to me, as a coach, that's just such a such a good sign of somebody being really engaged in the moment and kind of getting, basically just enjoying the game. And here, if we watch. After this attempt, he... he... And you can kind of tell it. It's like yeah. it's like a frustration, but the kind of frustration that makes you want to, you know, yeah. continue to throw yourself yeah. at a boulder. Yeah, he's still engaged. Yeah, absolutely, exactly. absolutely. And um, what what you just said about the the boulder having two different sections? You no, know, uh, uh, yes, I totally agree. And we can later we can look at the uh, at Adam Ondra, who was the only one who topped this problem, but struggled with this first. Uh, so-called parkour move but this is uh, uh, for, like for myself i think it's all physics right uh, it's not uh, this move that where he just got up this is actually it's not very complicated what you have to do you know and th this is um, why i think it's so important from early on from really early on if you start working with a young athlete to empower this person you know, so uh, basically what, what I try to, or I'm sure you too, or many coaches, uh, is that not necessarily that they learn a, a certain move. Uh, this is what you meant. Huh? When, yeah, yeah, and he shows yeah. that kind of a, a few uh, when, times in the boulder. Yeah, so uh, it's, uh, it's about learning to learn uh, to solve problems and not learning to solve this particular problem. You know, that because then you, you're, this is one boulder problem that gets you nowhere but you want your athletes to to be smart actually yeah, yeah. and really... i think do you have the item under section of it too yes yes i have the uh... yes and you see same thing but but almost uh, reverse you know and this is again you know with with the character traits you know because if you've watched a lot of competitions, uh, uh, Adam from time to time struggles, when we, with, without a doubt, the best climber in the world, but he, he almost creates his own uh, 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 problems. 
you know, so Adam is the only one who can beat Adam. You know, he can only be beaten by himself. And I, I'm almost think if there was more at stake, like this would have been the finals of the Olympic Games, then I think he wouldn't have climbed the problem. Maybe, maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm, I'm uh, walking in. But this is actually where uh, a really nice example where you see all these domains of physical literacy all come together at this moment. Well, because this is, it has a psychological, it has also the element, if this would have been topped, say, by, by Tomura Narasaki before, so the pressure is even higher. Uh, things like this, then the social domain comes into play. Or, uh, you know, many things uh, flow into this stupid little stand-up move. You know? And uh, so it's, it's, it's the whole, yeah, it's much more that, than it's even on this mind map that is at work there. It's certainly not that Adam uh, is incapable of doing this move, uh, for sure. Yeah, and you can kind of see, I think, where to, when they come down, you can also see their reactions and how they're different. You know, for him, he's focusing, okay, this is a foot issue. And I think that's really important. And, and something to highlight about Adam, because he will, you know, almost in every um, interview after a competition like this, you can watch him finally stick the move. It, I'll go back to go. Basically, this is one of the really impressive things because he was the only one, I think, that crossed through to that foot to finally basically do this sequence. And his strengths really sh like showed on this kind of slab climbing. Um, but ultimately, he had to learn the first part of the move. And I think that's a really com compelling route setting in that sense, because for Adam Andra, you know, he had to overcome, like you said, there's a thin margins for him not doing that move. Um, and essentially not being able to do the climb. But like I mentioned, Adam, in a lot of interviews, he'll be really quick to say, this is something that I am not good at. I think we've heard it. Even in that interview, he said he was very happy to do, you know, the, the coordination toe hook catch because he said, this is not necessarily my style. And I think a lot of other athletes would potentially say, okay, well, this is not my style. I'm not really going to focus it on it. If it, you know, like you mentioned, essentially, if that's the move, then that's a bummer and that comp I won't do so well. But Adam is, you know, really kind of tenacious in the sense of like, he really gave himself a process to learn to learn these moves. And you can see it yeah. on that boulder. And I think that's something that's really impressive. Yeah, yeah. And I, we certainly at one point will talk about this um, because it, beca it can become a vicious circle, you know, this self-fulfilling prophecy of telling yourself, you know, like even, even like it, it, as a coach, I don't even want to hear it when the athlete tells me that uh, she or he is not good in something because I feel it's almost when they say it, it becomes a little bit more true. And uh, I, I really believe... In, in, I mean, it's a little bit fashionable and um, this, the, the whole thought of a growth mindset, you know, almost a cliche, uh, you know, you have to be a growth mindset, but I totally agree. You have to uh, think of yourself as somebody who can change uh, their ways, you know, and, and improve in certain skills and make it work for for what you have physically or or movement wise as a talent and uh, i would always want to encourage everybody to uh, including all the coaches and the setters and everybody involved the parents to have this this growth mindset you know, because there's nothing is written in stone there's so many people that uh, think of themselves as not being good in this modern uh, style of bordering but i think most of them they're just uh, telling that to themselves. And maybe they lack this kind of coaching that could help them a little bit. Uh, this, uh, the, 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 for example, the progressions and regressions. Like when, when you said uh, your approach in coaching comes from route setting. And w when I hear this, I'm thinking constraints-led approach. So basically you're not act really coaching, but you set up the environment in a way 
that encourages the desired behavior. This is what the constraints-led approach is. And this is something we will talk about, you know? So, uh, and I think if, as a, as an athlete, if you have the, uh, the coaching or, or just environment that encourages this. So basically if you can't do the fan, fancy skating move that somebody will scale it back for you, you know, and make a, and regress it, make it, makes it a little bit easier. And then, uh, with, through gradual exposure, make makes it harder again till it's up to World Cup, Cup standards. I think you can. The, the, everything is possible. Yeah, I agree. I think that's one of the biggest. I think things that I see kind of with progression and climbing that's difficult for a lot of people. Um, I don't know. It almost be like to, in order to learn how to do an iron cross in gymnastics, you just try to hold an iron cross. And then you stop and you do that until you can hold an iron cross. That's not, you know, yeah. how that is approached. Your shoulders will be, uh, will be gone. By, yeah, but that's, that's very you're... frequent in climbing yeah. because yeah. most people, totally. they just totally. project totally. project a boulder and okay. it tends to be okay. very binary. It's like you either do the move or you don't. And the learning that yeah. happens in that is actually not great. So it, like, if you can really scale, I think for me, that's been a, a really driving principle is like, how can I you know, dial it back 5%, 10% on, and then slowly. And then when you, when you can do that, you can see how quickly people actually learn in a session. Yeah. And I think finding yeah. that those tools can be difficult. And especially like, well, I would have the advantage of being able to move things around constantly, but in a gym, you might not be able to have that, but there are ways still to do it. So, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. we've, we've chatted about a lot, but Yes, I think I think there's a general. You get the picture of what we will what we will talk about on yeah, this show exactly. on the on the climbing talent development show, and we're gonna go back to yeah. basically this. Uh, this is gonna be our roadmap, which we will use as kind of a common language and understanding of what we're gonna be talking about. And I think there's like as you said, it's a work in progress as it should be, because uh, a lot of people. It coaches, athletes, parents are working on a piece of this all the time. And for us, this is going to be kind of like something that we're going to be bouncing around frequently, either as, you know, competition, something might present itself that we can highlight as an opportunity for learning. Um, but just, I think we enjoy this aspect of coaching more than anything. Would you agree? Yes. Absolutely. And uh, if you want us to talk about certain aspects, please leave uh, comments below. And uh, we're doing the next show in two weeks time. Right? Anything Correct. more we should we should mention, Al? No, I think, uh, oh, I th I I think, think that's basically yeah. it. Thank uh, you for we watching. Hope you are as excited as we are about <laughs> and I think our, and our, our production quality might just improve a little bit over time as we're uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If we share videos or, or ideas that you might have I think for us it's it's going to be basically Udo and I have conversations and then we'll be like oh that will be interesting to talk about or we'll see something and we'll start chatting about it so all right thanks Udo it's good chatting with you